Glory to God. Well, we're going to get started right away. We started a lesson last week on uh, exercising our righteousness. We're going to do a slight review, and then we're going to actually get into how we do these exercises. This is uh, exercise in the Word of God. But I want to establish once again through the scriptures that what we're doing is scriptural. I just use a little analogy in explaining this, but uh, let's start off in the scriptures in the Word of God in Hebrews chapter 5. And some of this will apply to, to you, some of it might not. You might have just recently been saved, but there are others that have been saved for quite a while that this applies to very definitely. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. It says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. i just like to point out, this is saying, you've been saved long enough that you should be teaching this, but you've gone backwards. It says, for, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need which for one to teach you again. That means you have been taught this, but you need, it, you need to be taught again. Now this isn't the heavy, deep stuff. You understanding that? This isn't the heavy stuff of God. There's some stuff in here that's just mind-blowing. I mean, it just stretches your imagination beyond human limits. This isn't it. You know, if you go to the 19th Psalm and say, 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 says the firmament is the, 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 the power of his glory is seen in, in the firmament, you have to start then, what is he talking about? What's the firmament? What's that all about? That goes into some of the deeper things of the Word of God. You look up and you find out the word firmaments in the scriptures from the first chapter of Genesis right through the scriptures maybe 11 or 12 times. Who, how many have you heard taught about the firmament? Why God put it in there? He wants us to know. But we can't get to the deep things of God if we have need that one teaches us again, which be the first principles, the very basic things of God. Does that make sense to anyone? Why go on to something deeper if we haven't got, we had the first part, but then somehow we lost it and we have need that one what? Teach it all over again. So guess what I'm doing now? Teaching it all over again. But we want to get past this. It says, once again, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles or the word of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. I shared last week that when I was 12 years old, because of some things I did that I shouldn't have been doing, like drinking wine that had soured, I got food poisoning and I spent three months in bed. And I got to the place when I could eat that I started eating baby food. I had to eat pablum. And this is what this is saying. You are become such. I was eating everything before. Then I went from pablum to little bro broiled, not fried, pieces of hamburger, hamburger patties. That's what this is saying. You should be eating a steak. And you're up here trying to get someone to scramble a little hamburger for you. Let's finish reading this. It says, And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Is unskillful in what? The word of righteousness. Unskillful in the word of righteousness. Let's read a little further. For he is a babe. He's a baby. This sounds like someone that's retarded. <laughs> Doesn't it? Well, this couldn't, 
Well, we're not talking about anyone here. We're talking about all those people in those other churches this morning. It says, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Their senses what? Exercised. You know what that means, exercised? It means exercise. And it uses the illustration as an athlete works out. You need to work out. This is an exercise that God designed. This is an exercise plan of God's. And I love this exercise plan. And this whole analogy of this teaching that the Lord has given me is because just recently I joined a gym. And when I joined up, you know what they had? Exercise plans. Of varying amounts. <laughs> and then after joining and joining one of those plans, I had to go to the gym and exercise. Remember what I was saying about hard and easy? It was hard. <laughs> <laughs> but praise God, it's worth it. Is this going to be hard or easy? It doesn't really matter. Is it going to be worth it for you to do the exercise? Now I can tell you one thing that's much better than that plan I have at the gym. This is an exercise you do from a seated position. Just like you are right now. And about the heaviest thing you have to lift is this book. You could buy a stand, set it on the stand. Probably the hardest thing you have to do is keep from going to sleep. <laughs> Shouldn't have said that. Let's go to the paper that I shared with you. In Romans, on the first verse on the, on the paper, this is just a little review. On, in Romans, well let me point out that that did not say have their senses exercised to discern both good and bad. Did it? Said good and evil. Most churches today will give you exercises in good and bad. And part of the reason that these people are in this position where they become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat is because they have been given exercises in good and bad. And the churches are trying to get you to be good. And that is impossible. You know why? It's only one good. And that's God. And the easy way to remember what evil is, evil is not believing that God is good. That was the first original sin, do you know that? What Adam did was evil. Because he didn't believe that God was good. He believed Satan when Satan said, God's holding out on you. In other words, God is evil. He's portraying himself as good, but he's evil. <coughs> and now today, the churches have switched that over to good and bad. And it's a whole teaching on how they go about trying to get you to be good. That's erroneous. If you could never be good, why the exercise in trying to be good? What's going to be the end result of that exercise? Aren't you in the same position you were in before you started it? Did you ever make it to good? Jesus did not come here and die to make bad men good. He died to make dead men alive. We were dead in our sin and in our trespasses and Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundant. Remember him saying that? John 10.10, 10, I believe it is. All of this is in the Word. But if you don't rely on the Word and you rely on someone's, how, how do you say, pontification? 
how erudite and scholarly they talk, how well they dress or how good they drive, instead of relying on this book that is life to all your flesh. This is what you want to get an exercise in, this word. It's life. The very words of life. Now, our paper, Romans 16, 25. This is from the New Living Testament. It says, Now all glory to God, who is able to make you strong, just as my God, my good news says, this message is about Jesus Christ. This message about Jesus Christ has revealed his plan for you Gentiles. Now, a Gentile was anyone that was not a Jew. That's easy, right? If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Now we have Jews, Gentiles, Jewish believers and Gentile believers. That's what's in the eyes of God and in his word. That's who's, a, who's in the world today. Say so a plan kept secret from the beginning of time. What kept secret? God had a plan. Just like I joined the, 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 the gymnasium plan, the one that I did not join. What plan are you to, are participating in? Are you participating in God's plan? This plan was kept secret, let's, well let's read it. The plan kept secret from the beginning of time. You guys know what the plan is? How does that read in the, in the, Brother Eric, how does that read in the, you have a King James? Get it for me and see how that reads in the King James. That uh, 25th verse. Romans 16, 25. It says, but now as the prophets foretold, and, and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all Gentiles everywhere. To who? All men. Not all men. All Gentiles. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. And so when the scriptures tell you, you have it? 25. Now to them that is of power to establish you according to my doctrine and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. This mystery that was kept secret, this was one of God's plans. And the mystery was kept secret from the world because the world didn't know how the Gentile was ever going to get saved. Satan didn't know. The Jews didn't know. God kept it secret because had Satan known, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It wasn't kept secret from you, it was kept secret for you. How the Gentiles were going to get saved. The Jews had a way of being saved. Through the Mosaic Covenant. Well, what about the Gentiles? Because of this mystery that was kept secret, and because of a lack of study and understanding of the scriptures, a large portion of the church is still trying to teach the Gentile believers that they should get saved under the Jewish law. And that's where you get in trouble. Because the Jewish law was based on works. Being and doing what God said for them to do, which they couldn't do, and which you Gentiles can't do either, but it was never given to you? Did you know that? The Ten Commandments were never given to us. So why is it the church has so many believers trying to follow the Ten Commandments. Doesn't it sound like, come on, you guys be honest with me, doesn't it sound a little like blasphemy to say you shouldn't follow the Ten Commandments? Doesn't that sound wrong? I, I know it sounds wrong from the way I was raised. I mean, the very first thing I learned, the first catechism class, and I got cookies for it the next week, was the Ten Commandments. And I grew up under that, and I grew up believing that until the Lord opened my eyes to see what his word says, not what some man or some denomination says, or some religious doctrine says. What does the word of God say? You guys, you have your Bibles in front of you. Turn 
to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 2. Verse 11. Now, this isn't, you're going to read it in your Bible, right? I'm going to read it out of mine. You see if your Bible says the same. You did buy your Bible, right? Okay, let's see if your Bible says anything similar to this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision, but that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, is saying the Jews are calling you people uncircumcised. That's all they're saying. But what, what was the first two words in this? Wherefore, remember. Don't forget this. Had anyone forgotten it? You don't have to raise your hand. Wherefore, remember. What were they to rem remember? That at that time, verse 12, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, that's the Ten Commandments under the Old Covenant, Mosaic Covenant, having no hope and without God in the world. Does anyone's Bible say that? Why don't we remember this? Because we're going to go home today and turn on the television and flip by some Christian programming, they're going to be teaching the Ten Commandments. You were in the world with no God and no hope. And that was the mystery that was kept secret for us. That God had a plan for our salvation and it wasn't under the Commonwealth of Israel. It was not under the Mosaic Covenant. He had a plan of making us right with Him. And that's why we read about that for when the time, you ought to be teaching other people how they're righteous. You're not going to go, unless the Lord calls you a special, on a, puts you on special assignment, you're not going to be going to Israel. You're going to be going to these Gentiles that you live around and that you work with and are part of your family. What are you going to teach them? You're going to go back and teach them about a law that they were never a part of. You're going to let them stay in the world with no God and no hope. There's no hope of fulfilling the Ten Commandments. You read in the book of Hebrews in chapter 8, God found fault with the old covenant, so he did away with it for the children of Israel. He didn't do away with it for the world. You know why? The world wasn't under it. That's why the title of the book is the epistle to the Hebrews, the Hebrew believers. That's why the Scriptures Church tells us to study this book, to show ourselves approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are divisions in here. There's plenty of Scriptures that, was, were de that are designed for the Jewish believers. There are other scriptures that were designed for us Gentile believers. There are some scriptures that are designed for the church as a whole. But for us, we're to rightly divide this word so you know when it's talking to, to in the book of, of, of the epistle of John and James and, and Peter, those are Jewish epistles written to Jewish believers. Can you learn from them? Yes, you can learn from them. But you should realize you're reading somebody else's mail. An epistle is a letter. These were letters that were written under the inspiration of God to different churches. And we use them as scripture. And the scripture tells us to rightly divide the word of truth. And so when we get a heart to know the things of God. Now, this is not Bible study. This is teaching the Word of God. This isn't just a little Bible study. For you students that are going to school, you're going to see that this is something that you're going to be faced with. 
And if you don't get to the point that you teach this to where people say, well, that's heresy. He's teaching that we should sin. I never said that. I said you couldn't keep the Ten Commandments. They couldn't. You can't. You know, most of the world doesn't even know the Ten Commandments. Isn't that something? And us Gentile believers want to get in rallies and, and, and march on schools and march on, on the Board of Education to petition them to put the Ten Commandments up on the walls of our school. Just like the Apostle Paul had to tell Peter in front of the whole church, Peter, you're wrong. He said, Peter, you couldn't keep those Ten Commandments, and your fathers before you couldn't keep those Ten Commandments. Why are you trying to put on the Gentiles what you Jews could not do? Yes? Most people don't know five of them. And they definitely don't know the order of them. But we want to put them up on our, uh, the worst thing in the world that I could think of is have a kid, impressionable age, going by five days a week reading Thou Shall Not Kill. Thou Shall Not Kill. All day long. All over the school. Thou Shall Not Kill. What's on that kid's mind? God found fault with the Ten Commandments. That's why he made us a new covenant based on better promises. What is the new covenant? Let me ask you this. Let me ask you, let me ask you this. Well, we, we have some people in here that far for the time we ought to be teachers, right? We have some of us been saved long enough that we ought to be teaching. Let me ask you this. What does the new covenant tell you that you have to do or that you cannot do without villa or that you the things you shouldn't do without violating the new covenant tell me someone give me a scripture tell me what does the new covenant tell you that's something how quiet it is in here thou shall not keep thou shall not put false the, the old covenant is full of them Shall not commit adultery, shall not commit murder, shall not lie, shall not... I learned them, I told you, six years old. What does the new covenant... Are we, do we have any new covenant believers in there? Well, what does the new covenant tell you you have to do to keep the covenant? Does it tell you you have to believe? I'm glad you're thinking along with me, though. That, that's what I want. I want this, is, this isn't putting you on. Don't, please don't feel like I'm trying to put anyone down or, or exalt myself. I want us to think. God wants his children to think. The scripture says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. He doesn't want a bunch of ignorant followers. He doesn't want a bunch of retarded children. We say we're new covenant believers. Isn't that right? You guys let me know now if I'm getting off track. Don't we claim to be new covenant believers? Yeah. Well, what does the covenant tell us to do? It doesn't tell you to believe. To, be, to, to, to participate in the new covenant, you have to believe. The gospel, the good news, is the good news of salvation to everyone who believes okay but what are the, the the old covenant told you this is you shall and you shall not are there any you shalls is that a requirement for the new covenant let me tell you why you can't think of any. There are none. Yes, there is. You have to believe. No, that's to participate. To be in covenant. To, to join in the covenant, you have to believe. Now that you're in covenant with him, you believe to get into the covenant. Right. Agreed? Now, what do you have to do to stay in covenant, not to break the covenant? 
continue in faith? So if you don't continue in faith, then you what happens? You're out of faith. But are you out of the covenant? Continue to believe. Well, if you don't believe in God anymore, yeah. Yeah, right. See, this is, this is, I'm glad we're talking like this, because this is what has happened to the church. Yes? The covenant, let's, let's, can we read the covenant, the terms of the covenant in the scriptures? You guys, is that agreeable? Okay, go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. We'll let God tell us. We'll have to, for the sake of time, we'll start reading in verse 6. I would advise you to read the whole book of Hebrews. It is so awesome. But not just read it, just study it. We'll start reading in verse 6. But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry, speaking about Jesus, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better, better promises. Verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there should no place have been sought for the second. Now I have to put a pen in this. I'm a teacher. Can't just read over this stuff. I can't. Who found fault with the old covenant? Do you know what fault he found with it? Are you sure? See, God found fault with the covenant, the old covenant. So we know one thing for sure, there's a fault with it. Can we say that? If we don't know what that fault is, and we're trying to follow it, how do we know that we're not following the faulty part? When someone is teaching you that old covenant, how do you know they're not teaching you the faulty part? One thing we can establish for sure, there's something wrong with the old covenant because God said it was something wrong with the old covenant. Is that what your Bible says? So we can say that honestly, right? There's something wrong with that old covenant. Let's read on. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is why we came over here. Verse 10, for this is the covenant I will make <coughs> excuse me, with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws under their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith the new covenant he has made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth, away, waxeth old is ready to vanish away. He just told you what the new covenant was. He said, this is the covenant I will make with them. Is that what it says? And then he says, I will, I will, I will. He didn't say you shall and you shall not says, I will, this is what I will do. It's a unilateral covenant made between God the Father and God the Son. You can't break it. You should shout glory, hallelujah, Pastor Stewart can't break it for me. What if I could break the covenant? You remember in the old covenant, someone did something wrong and like 50,000 people died? What if that was to happen? Ooh, what if Pastor Stewart was teaching error? Lightning come down here and kill all of us. I can't break the covenant for you. You can't break it for me. This is a better covenant based upon better promises. Better covenant. 
I will do this, I will do that. And he said, I will remember what? So if you sin, what happens between you and God? What did he just tell you? So what are you supposed to remind him? What is our role in this? Yes, but not, but not between your relationship with your Heavenly Father. That's the new covenant. That's the blessing of it. Sinning will eat your lunch and pop the bag. Sin will give Satan access to you physically and mentally, not spiritually. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. These scriptures mean something, church, and not just religious science. What does it mean to seal something up? That's why the scripture says in Ephesians, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Is your body still subjected to sin? Yes, it is. Is your mind still subjected to sin? Yes, it is. What about the sin that leads to death? Or um, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Um, the Mennonites and Sapphire, they were sealed, but then they lost. What happened to them? They were God. Their bodies and their minds. That, if, see, if church, if the, if the scriptures are arbitrary, God is not arbitrary. So if any time you see a scripture and you think it's arbitrary, is there anyone in here that has ever done anything worse than Ananias and Sapphira? Yeah. <laughs> well, why didn't this happen to everyone? God is not arbitrary. See, the church has been taught this old covenant, and because it's not to us, it's not for today, everyone teaches their own version of it. I hear things like people saying, well, you can't just live any old kind of way and expect God to save you. Well, that's a terrible news for me. I don't want you preaching to me, because I lived any old kind of way, and he did save me. You can't ex just live any old kind of way and expect God to bless you. He blessed me the greatest blessing there is, salvation, and I lived any old kind of way. But that is arbitrary. What, at what point will your bad living cause God to stop blessing you? Is it the same for you as it is for me? This, is, this makes, God is not arbitrary. His word is settled forever. But that does, can I, can I get anyone, well to anyone does that sound right? I don't mean in light of the scriptures, but does it sound right? You can't just live any old kind of way and expect God to bless you. Doesn't that sound right? The, the, the fallacy in it is so small. See, we're not to be ignorant of the devices of Satan or his subtleties. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I hope I challenge some of you to do what I did when I first started hearing this. I got my Bible. I started studying. I want to see if this stuff is true. You don't just tell me anything. I want to know for myself in my Bible, not in that funny Bible the preacher had. I want to know it's in my Bible that God said this and that he's consistent with it. Where I tell you to go? Ephesians chapter 1. All right, let me to see if your Bible reads this way. Remember what we just said, the statement, we can't just live any old kind of way and expect God to do what? To bless us. Read verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Wait a minute. Is there a difference in has blessed and will bless? What does has blessed mean? How many blessings did he bless us with? 
So if I'm acting ugly and expecting God to bless me, guess what? I'm an heir. Here's the Satan's part where you don't understand and you don't realize because we don't intend to go out and act the believers. You guys wouldn't be here this morning. Wouldn't be going to church. We get deceived into believing that if we're acting good, he will bless us. We're just as much in error. He has blessed us. If you took your own Bible right there that you have and went through these first three chapters of the book of Ephesians and mark on your Bible, every time you see the letters ED, or the word has, or is, you'll find out that almost everything you could ever dream of or ask of of God, he has done it or is doing it eternally. Let's, I, I want to point this out to you. According, verse 4, according as he, does your Bible say has? So this is what? Present tense, past tense, or what? Past. So this is something he has done. If you believe your Bible. No, my Bible doesn't say has. It says hath. Which means has. Anyway, he says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. When did he choose you? This is the mystery hidden throughout the ages. That you are going to be saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. God had a plan for yourself, but God's not a loser. Your father's not a loser. When Adam sinned, God knew he was going to sin. What a cruel God that would be to create man, be able to see a timeline from, from, from the time he created man till the time time the, 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 of the millennia, to the time of the new, the time of the end, as we know time, knowing man was going to sin and be lost forever and not do anything about it. What a cruel God that would be. A God that could create the universe and would create us to torture, to what? That would be a cruel God. God had, before God said, light be, and light was, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. You were saved. It's not us getting into salvation now so much as, uh, so much as it is getting a knowledge of salvation. That we have been saved in Christ Jesus. If we believe and accept the gift, it's a gift, of righteousness. Righteousness is a gift. We receive it by believing. Or we reject it. I got one scripture that keeps on ringing. Mm -hmm. It's about um, once we receive Christ and we deliberately keep on sinning, we're like spitting on Christ, and all we have left is. Like, See, this is why we, we're talking about, you're absolutely right. This is why we talk about rightly dividing the word of truth. Oh, what his question was, the scriptures say, say that if we willfully sin, there's not, he's not coming back again, it says in, in Hebrews. A fiery expectation. Remember this was written, that's in the book of what? Hebrews. It's, 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 it's written to a group of people that were under the law prior to becoming, coming into Christ. And so they had a reliance on the law. They had been raised up under the law. So the book of Hebrews is telling them that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice it's no more, see, the Hebrews had daily sacrifices and they had the Day of Atonement, once a year. This is what the book is talking about. We could go over there and study it, we've been studying it. And it's letting those people know that if they're looking for another Savior, another way out of the sin, they go on deliberately sinning, what do they have to look forward to? Jesus isn't coming back. And the Jewish sacrifices for sin, we're done away with. 
So what do they have to look forward to in their mind? You understand the context of this? You guys mind doing this? We'll, we'll, we'll do some exercises next week. You want to study the Word? You want to see, you want to see this in the Word? Huh? Go to, go to Hebrews chapter 10. You'll see some things in the Word of God that you haven't seen before. Now, like I said before, to get the true understanding of this, you need to read it in its context. You need to read the whole book, not read it, study the whole book. It's awesome. But we don't have time for that right now. So we're going at it here and there. Verse 1, for the law, that's talking about the law of Moses, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereon too perfect. In verse 9 it was talking about the Jewish sacrifices. This is talking about the Day of Atonement, that every year they had to make atonement for the sins of Israel. Every day they made atonement with the daily sacrifices for their own sins. This is a Day of Atonement for the nation of Israel. You got the picture? Okay. And it says that those sacrifices that they made could never perfect or mature the ones that were coming there to be cleansed of their sins. Okay, got the picture. Verse 2. It says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered. Do you see a question mark right in the middle of that sentence? It's asking you a question. God wants us to think. You know what the polite thing to do when someone asks you a question? Just answer it or tell them you're not going to answer it or something. God just asks us a question. He says, wouldn't they have stopped having this day of atonement, these yearly sacrifices, if they did it once and it perfected them forever? Would they have stopped? Hmm? So the answer is yes. We are we in agreement? Okay, let's read on then. Because it gives us the answer. Because the, wors the worshiper, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. Does that make sense? If that sacrifice had made them perfect, they wouldn't have had to continue having the sacrifices because they would have... We wouldn't have to make, be worried about it anymore. Isn't that right? Okay, now here's the question that these scriptures are asking you. Let me ask you a question, help you to think. Was Jesus the perfect sacrifice? Then I have another question. If Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, and the perfect sacrifice would purge the conscience from dead works, it says in, in chapter 9, and purge the conscience from sins, why are we so sin conscious? I wonder if I believe what I believe. I think it's the difference between condemnation and conviction. And, and, and who does he convict? Does it say the believer? The believer of what? of righteousness. Look it up. He convicts the world of sin. We're not in the world. We're believers. He convicts us of righteousness. That's what we're studying. See, we can't get past, if we don't ever get to the point where we believe that Jesus did not fail. He did not fail. But we have so much religion to get through, so much unbelief to get through. When I tell you that I learned the Ten Commandments, I wanted to be a priest. I was growing up in this. I had, this wasn't something new to me. I just had a period of time that I went away from it because it wasn't working. And so I went as far off the other way as I was into the Word of God. 
So I've lived life. I've been out there. And thank God he brought me back into this word. To where now I want to rely on this word and the power that he gives me to think. Thank you. The power that he gives me, the Holy Spirit gives me to think and to see this word. See, the book of Ephesians said that he would open the eyes of our understanding. We prayed that to this church every Sunday for over a year. And he's still doing it. I want my eyes open that I can see this. Jesus is the author of what kind of salvation? Eternal salvation. Is that right? What does eternal mean? We're thinking. Everlasting, never ending. Always was, always will be. Is that right? Who is the author of temporary salvation? Because Jesus' didn't work according to the church. If we're saved, we're saved what? Eternally or temporally? According to the scriptures, not you have to put Bishop so-and-so and Pope so-and-so out of your mind. What does your word say? Your Bible, you bought that Bible. Does your word say that you are saved temporarily? We just flip back a page. Verse 15. Well, verse 12 first. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption. We say we're redeemed, church. Aren't we the redeemed? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. How did we get a temporary redemption? Who authored it? Satan authored it. Chapter 9, verse 12. See, oh, there are definitely going to be consequences of sin. Please don't hear me saying you should just live any old kind. Live in any old kind of way will eat your lunch and pop the bag. Sinning gives Satan leeway into your body and into your head. You have been sealed. Did the seal break? I'm just going by what the scripture says. I can't turn to every chapter and verse, but we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It tells us in the, in the book of Ephesians. Did the seal break? We have eternal redemption. We have, been, we have the church has made the eternal temporary. We also says, and, and Peter, for we're not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold, but with what? The precious blood of of Jesus, the uncorruptible blood of Jesus. The church has found out a way to corrupt the uncorruptible blood of Jesus, to make eternal salvation temporary, and we the church, just like blind mice, instead of reading this stuff and looking at, look at verse 15, what does that say? And for this cause, talking about Jesus, he is the mediator of a New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the, let me put on my glass so I can quit skipping words. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. There's that word eternal again. How do we make the eternal temporal? Come on, church, help me with this. Either, either Jesus failed or we're saved eternally if we got saved. That's the challenge if we're just living any old kind of way, doing anything we want. Did we get saved when we got saved? This is what the scripture says. It says, examine yourself to see if you be of the faith. Not for me to examine you. For us to examine ourselves to find out, am I really a believer? But how can I believe if the work that Jesus did didn't work? Let's see. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Uh, sin, stealing, adultery, blaspheming, do what? Murder, 
coveting your neighbor's goods, coveting your neighbor's wife. How much of that now for us is under the blood? Huh? Everything. Everything. Anyone, anyone agree with that? Yeah. We have some that believe this. All of this is under the blood. We've got one that doesn't, two that don't, three that don't. Why? Because the blood of a bull or a goat could cover the sins of the people of Israel. Remember that us Gentiles weren't involved in this, right? But we're learning something. The blood of a bull or a goat could cover the sins of the people of Israel as a nation for how long? One year. How long does the blood of Jesus last? Well, we don't believe that. We say it and then turn right around and don't think that the blood of Jesus will keep us clean for five minutes. We can go to sinning five minutes later, have a bad thought. And we're right back, the believers right back, <coughs> believing, <coughs> excuse me, believing that they're not saved because of their actions. Five minutes later, let me show you this, the difference. Why, when you're, you need to get your Bible and study, it doesn't say read this book. It says study to show yourself approved. None of our sins are under the blood of Jesus. Wow. The blood of Jesus did not cover our sins. The blood of Jesus did away with sin. That's why our conscience should be free. So that we can focus on and exercise our righteousness. But we're going right back over the same principles, the same oracles, the first teachings of the Word of God. God's blood, Jesus' blood, is not atoning blood. Atone means to cover. The blood of the bulls and the goats covered the sins of Israel for a year. They were still under the blood. Our sins aren't under the blood. Why, why do we confess our sins? I got two questions. Okay. What's the first? I know it never says. I know you're thinking of 1 John 1, 1 9, right? It never says to ask forgiveness for your sins. It always says to confess your sins. I know that. Okay. Secondly, um, how do you address working out your salvation in fear and trembling? Work out the benefits of your salvation. You can't save yourself. Right. It's talking about working up, but the other part is more important because the church has been caught up in this. I'm, I'm a little over time, you guys. Uh, it's one of the most, I don't want to use that word. It's one of the worst teachings that has gone through the body of Christ. The, the, the question was, what about 1 John 1, 9? Basically, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know that verse, right? That's the one you're referring to? Go to 1 John and read me verse 7. Why don't the church know verse 7? First. John. First chapter, first John chapter one. First John one? Yeah, right. One seven. Hmm? I think it's eight if we say we have No, 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 no. I'm not talking about that. I wanted to know why we know first John one nine, but we don't know first John one seven. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. How many sins? All sin. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. His blood didn't work because you told me you have to confess your sins. To get cleansed from them. Isn't that, doesn't it seem to be a contradiction here? Remember the scriptures, we look at the scriptures as much as we can in totality. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So when you go to confess your sins to him, are you shedding blood? Then how are you going to get them forgiven? It's knowing what the, that's why it says study. The word confess right there, you're looking at it from a western mindset. 
and from modern day English. The word is a Greek word. The Greek word is homologia. Homo is a, it's a what do you call it, a two part word? I uh, can't think. Compound word. Homologia. The word homo means the same. That's where we get terms like homosexual. The same. Logio means the word. So now read it with the modern day translation of the word, and if you get your Greek concordance, you'll find out that's what it says. Now, if we say the same word about sin that he says, I see you, that uh, we'll know that we've been cleansed from all unrighteousness by verse 7. Didn't he just say that in verse 7? Yeah. So why don't we say the same thing? Confess the same thing, to say the same word. What else did he say about sin? He said that he would, the new covenant says that he will remember our sins no more. What are we doing? We're trying to drag dead cows before the throne of God. We're trying to bring sacrifices. So we want, we, we want to get to the point, and we'll do our exercise next week. Glory to God. I'm believing we will. Because it's through these exercises, see, that we stop having these conflicts. It's through exercising that we learn and know that we have been made righteous. We didn't become righteous through our good works. God made us righteous the same way the sin of Adam made us dead in our sins and trespasses. Yes, final question. That's, that's right. It cleanses us. It, 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 the difference in an atonement, a covering, and a remission. A remission, our sins have been remitted. The sins of the Hebrews were atoned for with the blood of bulls and goats. And it tells you that if you, if you read chapters 8, 9, and 10. It makes it pretty clear, pretty clear. With that, we're going to have our benediction that deals with righteousness. If you read that paper, if you happen to read that paper, we can't exercise our righteousness until we actually accept the fact that we have been made righteous.